Kurzen nur ein Hinweis für Sie als deutschsprachige Zuschauer. Sie können Ihre Fragen gleich später auf Deutsch stellen. Die Moderation wird dann versuchen, diese kurzfristig zu übersetzen und einzubinden. Dear ladies and gentlemen from around the world, my name is Johanna Heisting. I'm head of the Foundation's office in Baden-Württemberg, which is in the south of Germany. Before I introduce today's speakers, let me say a few words about our foundation, the Friedrich Naumann Foundation. Some of you might participate in one of our events for the first time, and you might ask yourself, what kind of foundation is this? So, based on the principles of liberalism, the Friedrich Naumann Foundation for Freedom offers political education in Germany and also abroad. With our events and publications, we help people like you to become actively involved in political affairs. And we support talented young students with scholarships. Since 2007, the edition for Freedom has become a part of our foundation's name. After all, freedom isn't exactly in trend these days in some places around the world. This makes it all the more important for us to campaign for freedom and to take on the responsibility that goes hand in hand with it. We have been doing this since our foundation in 1958. Our headquarters is based in Potsdam, Germany, and we maintain offices throughout Germany and in over 60 countries around the world. This online event is a, a true joint venture, so to say, of our colleagues from the international department in our office in New Delhi in India and my team in the south of Germany. What's in it for you? With this discussion, we want to take you outside of Germany and outside of your home country and show you the Asian perspective on the consequences of a global pandemic. COVID-19 has hit especially the tourism industry hard in South Asia. 48 million jobs are at risk many held by women and vulnerable communities in the informal sector. So what are the priorities for this recovery process? What role do European tourism companies and tourists play? Those are some of the questions that we want to discuss with our experts today, and I'm happy to introduce them to you now. First of all, from Germany, joining in a little bit is Frank Müller-Rosentritt. He is a member of the German National Parliament and the Committee of Foreign Affairs. He's a rapporteur of the Liberal Group on South and Southeast Asia, China, Japan, and India. He's an economist, and before joining politics, he was working for Deutsche Bank in different executive positions. Next to him, we have invited Dr. Mariam Shakila. She has over 30 years of experience nationally and internationally in serving both private and the public sector as an entrepreneur and senior policymaker. She is currently the CEO of Simdi Group in the Maldives. Welcome, Dr. Shakila. Also part of this discussion will be Tofik Rahman. He is le a leading tour operator of Bangladesh. He runs a highly successful destination management company, Journey Plus. Mr. Rahman serves as the Secretary General of the Bangladesh chapter of the Pacific Asia Travel Association. He provides technical input to the Bangladesh tourism on regulatory and promotional strategy. Also to you, welcome Mr. Rahman. Moderating this discussion will be my colleague, Dr. Najmul Hossein. He's the country representative of the Friedrich Naumann Foundation in Bangladesh. Happy to be part of your team tonight, Dr. Hossein. And uh, before we begin now, let me explain one or two procedural things. Later on, there will be the possibility for you to post questions. Please use the button on the lower end of your screen, the Q&A button, um, to hand in these questions. We will try to tie in as many as possible, but probably uh, we won't be able to treat all questions. And uh, please be aware that all questions will be treated anonym anonymously. And now, without much further ado, I'm handing over to you, Dr. Natchmul. Thank you. and. Enjoy our discussion tonight. My FNF, my FNF colleague from Germany for introducing the special guest of this event, Honorable Member of Parliament, 
Mr. Frank Mueller Rosentritt, and for introducing the two esteemed panelists from South Asia, Dr. Mariam Shakila of the Maldives and Mr. Taufik Rahman from Bangladesh. I am Najmul Hussain, the country representative of the Frederick Norman Foundation for Freedom in Bangladesh. I'm very pleased and privileged to serve as the moderator, moderator of today's discussion. Uh, as, uh, in, a short, in a short period, we'll expect an impact talk from the honorable member of the parliament, Mr. Frank Mueller Rosendit, uh, to give his insights and perspectives on today's theme uh, of tourism for global recovery, a South Asian perspective. The format of today's event will be as follows. After we hear from Mr. Rosentritt, Frank Rosentritt, I will make, I might as well go ahead and make some introdu introductory remarks of how, how this uh, event will undergo this evening. As a moderator, we'll have three resource persons or experts as panelists, and I shall use my discretion to ask specific questions targeting one of the panelists while response to other questions may be expected from more than one of the three distinguished guests. Following the plen plenary session, which will be about for about 40 minutes, there would be a five minute musical interval. You will be entertained with the flavor of Bangladeshi music and dance performed by two young Bangladeshi amateur artists. A question and answer will follow after the musical interval. The question and answer session will be for about 20 minutes. As Mrs. Hastings has uh, requested you, I do it again. Please send your question on the chat mode. And during the Q&A session, I shall read out a select number of the questions to the pan panelists for their response. So uh, may I ask Ms. Mrs. Hastings, is our honorable MP on board? Yes, welcome, um, Mr. Frank Miller Rosenthal. Great. Uh, so, may I now uh, request the Honorable uh, Mr. Uh, Mr. Frank uh, Frank Miller Rosenthal to make some introductory comments? Over to you, sir. Yes. Uh, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Sorry uh, um, for the technical issues, uh, but now it works. And a very warm welcome to all uh, participants of this online event. Um, but before I move to the uh, specificities of today's discussion, I would like to uh, highlight that uh, these are trying times and uh, wish all participants strength and uh, motivations uh, because the political world situation is tenser than it has been for a long time. And this has been um, exacerbated by the completely unforeseen COVID-19 crisis. Germany, um, with close relations in all parts of the world, must therefore play a key role um, as a mediator between the parties to any conflict, as well as supporting friends beyond our borders, especially your region. Um, the Free Democrats, or FDP group, speaks out clearly against aggressive violence of international law, and at the same time, we want to strengthen civil society the dialogue with countries with which political relations are particularly um, tense. Um, with the breakout of a uh, devastating crisis all over the world, um, we witness that the values of freedom and individualism are more than ever in question. We see it in Myanmar, we see it uh, two days also in Europe, in Belarus, in Minsk. And this time, we must create understanding, promote dialogue, and advertise our liberal uh, values through intensive exchange in culture, education, and of course, in science. And as a part of this um, endeavor, we are actively engaging with South, South Asian region. I visit this region very often. I've been in, I've been in Malaysia, been in Indonesia, uh, India, of course, of course, South Korea, and so on. Um, as a key areas of liberal political education, human rights, uh, good governance, and, and open economy. And one aspect is 
our support to initiate regional exchange to rebuild a major uh, contributor to the Southeast uh, Asian economy, and this means uh, tourism. Tourism is a form of cultural and economic uh, interaction, thus it is synonymous for me uh, to an extension of diplomacy. Tourists, informal and sometimes formal um, um, representatives of their states, of regions, or also of countries. As tourists, uh, they visit places across lands and across countries to enjoy the beauty, uh, culture, landmarks, uh, uh, like food, food, and much more. Um, the host to learn more than tourism generates jobs and income. worth over one, one trillion US dollar, and the sector has contributed around 10% of the world's GDP and has created employment opportunities for more than 300 million people. Um, so um, since at some point in 2020, every country uh, on earth had travel restriction in place. Um, it is no surprise that the tourism industry has been hit very hard by the COVID-19 pandemic. We can already see some of these consequences in Germany too, but also, and I think it's very, very uh, big issue in South Asia, where in recent years, tourism has been one of the uh, fastest growing sectors in the last year. The World Travel and Tourism Council, ETTC, estimated that 100 million jobs in the sector are at risk, um, also states that 62 million jobs have already been lost. And I see it also in my hometown, how many people working in tourism uh, now uh, left uh, this sector, moved to another jobs. And now if the, if the, if the tourism now uh, reopening, they have, they have no uh, employees. And it's very, very difficult also, also, in, also in Germany. Just a couple uh, of hours ago, I read a study uh, published by the World Bank Group uh, stating that a fight against uh, COVID may have cost South Asia up to 10 million uh, tourist related jobs and approximately 52 uh, billion dollars in GDP. Um, not to mention that uh, millions of other jobs in the sectors are still affected, putting women and other vulnerable members of our society at risk of uh, losing their only income opportunities. So I'm looking forward to this uh, discussion. I'm uh, looking forward to this intensive dialogue. And I think we have uh, great uh, opportunities to come together. We have great opportunities in exchange between Europe, between Germany and your region, Southeast Asia. I think there's a big chance. Uh, and now we uh, should take this time to discuss how we uh, handle this um, uh, this this massive uh, time we have. Thanks a lot. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Frank Muller Rosentritt. Sir, your presentation was most was uh, very insightful and very illuminating. And I think it sets the stage for a very useful and constructive discussion this evening. Thank you again, sir. Now, may I move on and um, get into the panel discussion scenario. But before that, let me kind of highlight the areas or themes we'd like to address in today's discussion. One, how bad has been the adverse economic impact of COVID-19, especially on the job market of the tourism sector? 
The second issue we'd like to reflect on is that almost every government government across globe have tried different interventions targeting to salvage or to, to uh, uh, assist the tourism sector. The question is how effective has been these government interventions and where, where are there rooms to bring improvements? The third and the last theme would be what are the, some of the immediate short-term and medium-term strategies and policy reforms that are essential for restarting the tourism sector in South Asia in particular and globally in general? <laughs> now to the specifics. I'm going to ask uh, a few questions. Let me start off with the macro issue of, as Mr. Mr. Uh, Frank Miller Rosentrade has highlighted, the severity of the economic uh, uh, downturn and the cost of, uh, that has been imposed on the tourism sector due to the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, just to highlight uh, with some specifics, in South Asia, since we have two resource persons from the Maldives and Bangladesh, uh, the World Bank estimates that in 2020, uh, the loss from revenue for Maldives will will be around 700 million US dollars with over 35,000 jobs at risk. For Bangladesh, Bangladesh is a bigger economy. Its potential loss to GDP will be about $2 billion. And the number of jobs that are at, uh, at our high risk uh, are as close to a half a million. Well, job losses are felt not only by large size enterprises, but also by small and medium enterprises, SMEs, as well as the informal sector. The poor disadvantaged youngsters selling souvenirs at tourist spots to supplement the family income are unable to contribute now. To make things worse, unlike say Germany or in the United States, unemployment benefits from the state, at least for a certain period, are not offered in South Asian countries. Under this gloomy scenario, I would like to pose the following question. What can or can be done to alleviate this grim situation relating to job loss, businesses shutting down, and other economic losses in the immediate and mid-term? I would like I would request Dr. Shakila from Maldives to reflect on this question. Over to you, Dr. Shakila. I couldn't hear you very well, Najmul Hussain. Dr. Najmul, I couldn't hear you very well. Let me repeat again then, ma'am. Uh, there has been uh, a huge loss, the economic, economic loss, and uh, I would like you to focus a bit more on the job situation and the uh, layoffs, etc. Uh, so my question to you is, what for the survival of the tourism sector, especially small businesses and the prevention of layoffs are of critical concerns of most countries. Under this scenario, what can or has been done to alleviate the situation relating to job loss, business shutting down and other economic losses in the medium, uh, in the immediate and medium term? Did you hear me, Dr. Shakila? Uh... I, I didn't hear you very well. It was just getting cut off here and there. But if it is uh, the, the first question that you have uh, sent us, then um, I have the answer for it. Um, I can talk about it. Um, well, um, as mentioned um, by everyone, all, all the eminent speakers who have spoken over here, the incomparable economic predicament caused by the pandemic uh, has a disastrous impact um, on our tourism industry. But at the same time, it also underscored the vulnerabilities of the Maldives um, economic model. And then so um, our government responded promptly to mitigate the impact of the pandemic on uh, Maldivians with several health economic and social measures. So to support the households and firms, it provided temporary discounts on utility bills. It lowered retail fuel prices, imposed price controls on food staples, declared a 
a moratorium on repayments for selected businesses and personal loans, deferred housing rent and resort lease rent payments, and extended special financing facilities to affected businesses, including uh, to small and medium-sized enterprises. It also reallocated public expenditures to increase spending on health and emergency preparedness measures, and implemented monetary policy measures to boost liquidity to financial institutions. Um, at the same time, the scheme um, was initially introduced from April to June, subsequently extended to October, and then for a final time until the end of December 2020. As of uh, 12th March 2021, the government had dispersed uh, Maldivian uh, Rufia 318.8 million, which is uh, equivalent to 20.7 million um, US dollars. Um, in such allowances to nearly 20,000 Maldivians, over a third of respondents to the World Bank phone survey indicated that these cash transfers were the most helpful form of assistance uh, they had received. And to support Maldivians whose income were affected by the COVID-19 pandemic from April 2020, the government offered monthly payouts of uh, up to Maldivian um, Rufia 5,000, which is equivalent to USD uh, 324, under the income support allowance scheme. So those who were unemployed on or uh, no pay leave or had their salary deducted or earnings affected by the pandemic were eligible to apply for the scheme through the Job Center web portal. In March 2020, the government implemented an economic recovery program worth um, uh, USD 162 million, which is around 3.4% of the country's GDP. And this program mainly included a loan scheme to support businesses with a condition to retain employment. The program was targeted towards self-employed workers um, with annual turnover less than uh, Maldivian Rufia 10 million in 2019, who are facing difficulties in meeting their current operational requirements due to the pandemic. The program also included a debt moratorium scheme to encourage businesses uh, business continuity. Additionally, an income support allowance scheme was attached to the relief program to support individuals who lost their job or income due to this. Experts believe that the moratorium was the most effective policy as many house owners spend a large chunk of their income on mortgage repayments. Without this scheme, many believe that we would not have survived through this pandemic. As we speak, the country is going through its worst situation in relation to the pandemic in terms of infection rate including deaths, among huge pressure on the health infrastructure and health professionals. Although some inhabited islands, um, especially the capital city, Male, is going through huge challenges, resort sector is pretty much controlled due to the strong precautionary measures implemented to address the initial challenges when the first wave of COVID um, hit us. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Shakila. That was very elaborate about the intervention from the government and what you think has been more effective than others. Thank you. Now, I, may I request my fellow Bangladeshi friend, Mr. Taufik Rahman, to respond to this question again about what has been done and uh, under this grim situation about the job situation and what sort of interventions the government has tried to do successfully and others not so well, well done. Over to you, Mr. Rahman. Uh, thank you very much. Good evening from Bangladesh. Uh, am I audible? Are you hearing me? You are, sir. Okay, thank you. Thank you very, very much. Well, um, it's my great honor and pleasure uh, to have this uh, session. And welcome to Dr. Sakila. Welcome, Mr. Frank Muller, Mr. Najmul, and other uh, participants. Well, the situation in Bangladesh is not like in Maldives. Unfortunately, uh, tourism is not at all the priority sector from the government. Uh, you know, a country like Bangladesh, we have so many other important problems like uh, food, like a shelter, like safety or something like this, you know. So we, from the private sector, are trying our level best to uh, promote tourism, to convince uh, the government uh, to um, try to under, make them understand the benefit, economic benefit of the country. And uh, I can tell you that since 2010, when uh, the Bangladesh Tourism Board form, 
then um, the tourism has been a, a takeoff stage, I can say. So it is almost 10 to or 11 years. Uh, since I'm representing a, an association, which is which is called uh, PATA, as you know, the uh, Pacific Asia Travel Association, PATA's headquarters is in Bangkok. And we are uh, representing a chapter. I'm sure that in Maldives also they have a PATA chapter. So I'm holding a position of Secretary General. So uh, when these uh, COVID started at, uh, last year, in June, from our uh, part of Bangladesh chapter, we did a small survey to see uh, what is happening with the different travel and tourism industry in the Bangladesh, because we have uh, so many associations, like we have aviation uh, association, we have a tour operator association, we have a travel agency association, hotel association, recreational association, and so, so many other things. And what we have found, because these statistics is from February to June in 2020. After that, you know, nobody has done a, any specific survey because we are from private sector. So everybody is thinking about their own, uh, um, uh, you know, thinking about themselves. So what we have found, you know, the aviation sector, you know, we have a two private airlines. They have lost almost, uh, if I talk about the Bangladeshi Taka in crowds, which is almost 500 crowds, the hotel resort industry lost almost 1500 crowds, and they um, uh, lost almost 100,000 job uh, loss. Travel agent is almost 2000 crowd, and job loss is almost 10,000. Tour operator, which is including inbound, outbound, and domestic, and also uh, some of the travel agents are involving with the Hajj and Umrah, is almost uh, 4,000. Uh, the restaurant, the coffee shop, the first food, they almost lost 500 crores and almost 150,000 employee job loss. And then other transportation vehicle. And, it, and what we have found in total, al almost 95 crore US dollar is has been lost within these four months. So February, March, April, May, and June actually is five months. And total, we have found that 310,000 skill and semi-skill employee from the tourism sector lost their job. So if I is talking about this year, I'm sure that uh, this already uh, double, almost double. And you have uh, mentioned in your paper that almost uh, 2.03 billion GDP has been lost and 420,000 jobs has been lost. In Bangladesh, directly or indirectly, almost 40 lakhs, I think is 4 million people are working in the travel and tourism sector. You know, it's a huge uh, uh, industry, um, but unfortunately, if I'm talking about the government support, uh, I'm sure that in Maldivian governments, because tourism is one of their high priorities, so Maldivian government is uh, thinking for their employee in a high level. But in Bangladesh, unfortunately, though our honorable prime minister has been declared a stimulus, uh, stimulus uh, uh, package incentives last year, you know, it's almost 300 crore taka for the service sector. But as I told you earlier, that tourism is not at all that type of priority for the government. I mean, our one of the topest government uh, priority is the uh, RMG, the ready made garments, you know. So they are actually getting what I'm trying to say that the big, you know, fish, they are getting all these stimulus package, you know. But a small fish like ourselves, the travel agent, tour operator, actually, we we say ourselves in a very small industry. I mean, even we are not in a medium industry, you know, it's a small industry. I'm, I'm not talking about the hotel or, or resorts or real lines. They're the big industry. But as a tour operator, travel agents, you know, small uh, cruise operators, small transport, tourism transport operators, they're very small in number. And unfortunately, the stimulus incentive package is there. The government declared that um, uh, the bank, you have to go through a bank and uh, it's 9% interest. So you have to pay 4.5% and government will also pay 4.5% from the pocket. But un unfortunately, for example, I'm talking about myself. I am fully an inbound tour operator. You know, uh, my main market is Europe. Germany is also one of my very favorite market, though I am the 
market leader for UK inbound to Bangladesh. So because we are an inbound tour operator, unfortunately, we didn't get a single amount of money from the government, you know, because the procedure is so uh, difficult. I mean, uh, though is an, uh, is an incentive, but you have to go to a, a specific uh, bank, you know, and if, uh, if you go through a bank and bank has their some set criteria, you know, so you have to fulfill this criteria. You have to lend something, you know, for a mortgage, you know, some uh, some of your wealth, you know, something you have to deposit it. You know, unfortunately, a operator, a small uh, uh, company is not capable to give all those sort of things, you know. So unfortunately, what is happening now? The, the sad part is in Bangladesh, some of the travel agent and tour operators some of them already stopped their offices. Some of them already cut down their employees, 50%, you know, because you have to pay some other things like utilities, like uh, taxes, like a uh, red license fees and some other things. So it is very difficult for a company like a uh, tour operator or travel agent because our income channel is almost zero. So what they're doing now, they are try to, uh, try to find out some other way for their uh, livelihood, for their living. You know, some of them, you, you don't believe that some of the tour operators are now doing some other business, like they're selling now spices, now, now they're selling now honey, they're selling now tea, you know, whatever. Even some of the operators are involving with some, you know, fish market or even meat market or something like this. So it, it is a very you know scaring situation for a country like bangladesh i can tell you about myself i'm involving in this industry from the last 27 years and after 27 years i found myself as a jobless person you know because you know i only know the tourism tour operations you know other than that i have no other skill uh, job you know so the okay. situation is thank you mr raman so we, yes. we want to cover a few other issues. Thank you, sir, okay. very much. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. If I uh, stall for a minute, uh, what have we heard? We heard uh, a very elaborate uh, discussion from Dr. Shakila about government's interventions and uh, a real experience of what's going on in Bangladesh with individual uh, tour operators, suppliers, to uh, people working in this, in this sector. Let's kind of look at it a bit more of a positive note. And I'd like you, both of you, to reflect on, we now understand what the status is. What do we do in the, in, in the short term or medium term to revamp this sector? More specifically, uh, may I now address Dr. Shakila? Uh, where can you see that the public-private partnership can uh, be involved uh, and even going beyond that at the regional level, what can be done to see a rebound with this sector? Uh, I would like you to emphasize some some ideas. For example, do we need uh, retooling the, the workers, skills development, digitalization? Uh, what needs to be done, as Mr. Raman was saying, there are a lot of people exiting the industry, trying to get into occupations that they had not, have hardly any experience or interest in the past. So, Dr. Shakila, uh, you focus a lot on the government part. Can you now reflect, you being a leading entrepreneur of the Maldives, what, where do you see you're going with, with uh, your businesses and your you know, fellow, fellow entrepreneurs in Maldives and those who are involved in the sector? Over to you, Dr. Shakila. Uh, the tourism sector and then of course um, Maldives uh, concentrates on tourism sector and most of our businesses are either directly or indirectly related to the tourism uh, tourism sector. So in that sense, um, I think if we are talking about uh, creating uh, confidence um, um, uh, um, within the region, then I think um, regionally everyone will have to hold hands together um, and then basically um, do something that is consistent, whether it is uh, digitally um, or whether it is through the policies uh, in order to create the safety bubble because tourism cannot uh, survive or tourism 
cannot happen unless we demonstrate that there is safety um, uh, in what we do, uh, safety for the um, um, for the people to come in. Now, um, digitalization um, has been uh, has uh, has to happen. There was no choice for us to basically operate. And then hence, uh, when we could not operate, um, the businesses uh, normally as the tra under traditional means, um, we had to actually uh, implement our digital measures and then undertake it. Um, there's a long way to go still for us to be able to perfect that. But in terms of um, in terms of um, what the government has done, basically, um, I think is what um, I would like to concentrate on, um, which actually created uh, the uh, created the market, uh, build the confidence um, among people, and then what happened? I think impacted the whole economy to all the all the businesses as well, because unless tourists come into our country, none of the other businesses uh, will survive. Because everything happens either directly or indirectly, as I mentioned before, um, um, uh, connected to the tourism. So basically, um, um, we, we we should all agree that economic recovery cannot occur unless we bring in tourists to our country. And so, rather than only handing out um, relief packages and all that that I mentioned. Um, uh, as an indefinite solution, the government of Maldives also started working on easing a safe hassle free pathway for tourists to arrive to the Maldives. It has been successful and employment has improved and the robust recovery in tourism um, thus far is uh, because of that. The positive developments in tourism sector during the first quarter of 2021 is mostly as a result of the um, uh, some strategic actions and efforts to facilitate access, diversification of the brand and refreshing the destination statements and investing in aggressive and creative marketing and public public relations campaigns that were successfully implemented. A key selling point, especially in the COVID era, is the one island, one resort concept, which enables travelers to the transported directly from the main international airport to the islands. Other actions uh, that were also that also included, which again impacted all the other businesses, was um, the, the Maldives created what they call the Maldives border miles. So it is an intriguing concept a three-tiered loyalty program implemented in September 2020 as a joint effort between the Ministry of Tourism, Maldivian Immigration, and Maldives Airport and the Maldives Marketing and Public Relations uh, Corporation. I believe that Maldives became the first country in the world to launch such a loyalty program for visitors, and this loyalty program influenced consumer behavior. Now, this is a three tiered, uh, three tiered one, which was then followed by a lot of other businesses as well in regards to this loyalty program. Now, um, apart from the Maldives border, um, uh, border miles, the other strategies that were used were insurance packages prior to journey to the Maldives. So I think this is something regionally um, can be done as well. It covers you for specific expenses you may incur due to a positive diagnosis of COVID-19 or following um, you being placed in a uh, mandatory quarantine facility after being in contact with a person infected with COVID-19. Another strategy used was increasing direct flight connections. So they had um, uh, regionally, I think with India and all this, um, they started uh, uh, having these marketing campaigns and then creating uh, customized packages Packages. And then also UNDP launched um, uh, UNDP and UNWTO collaborated a pilot project reimagine uh, tourism. So this means uh, like basically uh, digitizing um, at the same time um, also creating a sustainable uh, sustainable tourism model. So this means all the businesses then followed um, all the other businesses and re related businesses also followed sustainable models. And another strategy used was a dozen must do experiences in the Maldives. And then another one was promoting Maldives as a safe destination in parallel with special strategies, such as negative PCR to enter trainings on safety measures, contact free amenities, wherever possible. Even in all our hotels, we had to do that. We started holding internships for foreign students unless two locals are taken as interns per foreign intern. Also, um, uh, I am vaccinated campaign. They started Visit Maldives has teamed up with the country's Ministry of Tourism to launch 
I am vaccinated campaign and also safe travel stamp granted by World Travel and Tourism uh, Council, which helped to rebuild confidence among travelers. Um, and then Maldives achieved the safe travel um, stamp on, I think, 15 September 2020. Now, modifications of amenities. We brought modifications to all our amenities, interiors and equipment um, with touch free solutions as much as possible at airports, resorts, hotels, transfer vessels, guest houses safari boards, and also limiting the number of items to be sanitized. The government has also reduced acquisition costs for resorts due to investor demand, although it is, um, um, it is um, amid COVID-19 pandemic, and the reductions would cost the government um, uh, about 82 million, and yet they did it because there was such in, uh, investor interest. It estimates that the long term gain would compensate for the short term loss. So there are a lot of things and all these strategies that I mentioned uh, have been uh, um, implemented by the government um, into the tourism sector. But then all the other businesses that we do are related to the um, tourism sector. In that sense, we also um, as individual businesses um, um, implemented these strategies within our businesses. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Shakila. But just a very maybe a very uh, naive question uh where do you see uh, maldive tourism a year from now in terms of the whole environment what what's in it in your crystal ball where do you see things will be in maldives in a year from now i think a year from now tourism will be um will be will be very good um but then uh, as I speak like this uh we are actually having uh, an, another wave of um uh pandemic um, hitting us right now, uh, the COVID-19 hitting us right now. But then uh, because of the um, collective uh, strategies uh, implemented by the government to protect the tourism sector, it is not translating or affecting the tourist uh, tourist resorts. So this is what uh, has been marketed. So the country is uh, uh, has, has actually gained um, um, even even this month, I think uh, we had, uh, let me see, I think I have the figure somewhere over here. Uh, we had about over 444,000 tourists arriving. So this is a huge a number, um, 4,000 tourists. And then this, uh, this whole period from the beginning of the year up until now, we already have almost half a million um, tourists arriving. So uh, the, the we are estimating that we would have about 1.7 million uh, um, tourists arriving. But also, um, uh, having said that, the markets also have shifted, um, actually, you know, from, from what it was. Um, so the shifting of the market is very interesting because earlier it was the European market um, actually had about 32%. The whole market uh, scenario changed um, to, um, uh, to, to, to mainly um, uh, uh, to, to, towards India um, and then uh, the uh, the other Asian countries so uh, and and uh, and Russia so the market shifted from Europe and the um, and the um, Asian market the overall Asian market to um, India and then um, Russian market and uh, and then um, uh, like, um, let me just uh, try and quote some figures. Um, as I said, due to localized targeted strategic marketing plans, the compulsion of tourists has shifted away from Asia and Western Europe towards India, Russia, and Eastern European countries. And Maldives aims to welcome 1.5 million tourist arrivals this ongoing year and is gearing up to mark 50 years since the tourism industry um, inception um in 2000 uh, in 2022 which is to be celebrated as the golden year of tourism in maldives so latest statistics publicized by the ministry of tourism on sunday revealed that uh, 410043 visitors had been welcomed to the velana international airport between january 1st and then may 8th so of these 20273 visitors have been wel welcomed so far this ongoing month itself which is 36.4% less than the number of uh, recorded in the same period in 2019. However, we are still very optimistic that things will improve. Thank you very much, Dr. Shakila. Now to my friend, Mr. Rahman. 
Mr. Rahman, uh, a, a bit of a uh, move away from uh, from what we've been talking about. Can we focus a little bit on domestic tourism? Uh, as you know, Maldives, we are at the two extreme spectrum. Maldives is heavily dependent on international tourists, but in Bangladesh, the domestic tourism had been uh, have show, uh, demonstrated a very uh, healthy growth over the years. In fact, many argue that domestic uh, tourism and drive to markets are likely to be the first to recover and inter intra-regional travel between COVID-19 safe zones are likely to be the next markets that rebound after domestic travel. Uh, for Bangladesh, domestic tourism spending uh, as a percentage of GDP is, is around 2.6%, which is at par with Maldives, but lower than other South Asian neighbors. As we see in the, in the news, uh, in, in, in China, in fact, we see a bit of a boom in uh, domestic tourism defined as the, the citizens, the locals are uh, going uh, around the country at a higher rate now. Even in Bangladesh, as you know, we have seen the young and the old are crowding the popular tourist spots uh, when, whenever there is a bit of an ease in travel restrictions at, as places as the beaches in Cox's Reserves on the Bay of Bengal. So my question to you, Mr. Rahman, just focusing on domestic tourism, your views on the current strategies and policies of government and the private sector in promoting domestic tourism. And in, in fact, since you uh, serve in various boards and involved with associations, uh, what is the status of private public, public partnership in promoting domestic tourism in the backdrop of this COVID-19 pandemic? Over to you, Mr. Rahman. Yes, thank you. Thank you very, very much. Um, if you if you see the UN WTO um, survey, also WTTC survey, everybody is saying that now is the time to concentrate on domestic tourism. Okay, um, I also strongly agree. Though though we are not China, we are not uh, India. You know, India is a huge state. China is a is a big country. So each of the state of India is uh, almost similar to Bangladesh. Uh, but the thing is, you know, if you are talking about the foreign exchange earnings, if you're talking about the good, uh, positive image, if you're talking about the employment generation, definitely we should concentrate international or inbound tourism. In Bangladesh, if you see from the last four or five years, the domestic uh, tourist market is in, increased a lot. You know, um, if you see the statistics that almost uh, Almost uh, 97 point, I think 4% is uh, income is coming from the domestic market and only 2.6% of the income is coming from the international market, you know. Uh, and to some extent in Bangladesh, some of the spots uh, is overcrowded, I can tell you, you know. So we actually, the, or the government is strongly thinking to have the carrying capacity of each of the destinations. And for example, the Cox's Bazaar, which is the um, unbroken white sandy beach in, in the world, longest sea beach in the world. If you see in the Cox's Bazaar, uh, the huge number of people are going and some of them are staying in a hotel uh, in, a, in a holiday time. Some of them is not getting a hotel. They are returning back to uh, some other nearby destination or some of them are even uh, staying at night at the bus, you know or at the lobby of the hotel, something like this. So uh, domestic market is uh, actually is booming. And all the at this moment, because the outbound is totally stopped, inbound is also stopped because we don't have a flight as is coming. And also the COVID situation, government is not allowing. Um, though, you know, we are very much hoping that if uh, uh, the tourists uh, completed their second dose, you know, and then get this certificate, maybe they will be allowed to come into Bangladesh. But what I am strongly thinking, every all the experts are saying that uh, that uh, we should forget about the long haul tourism at least from next two years. And I don't know about the situation in Maldives, but I already talked with some of my friends from India, from Sri Lanka, from Nepal, from Bhutan, and everybody saying that yes, we should concentrate on the short haul market, or in some extent, is the regional market. Or, uh, uh, or is cross border tourism, you know, just think about that India is surrounding us. So we have so many opportunities to 
exchange our tourism from Indian different state, for example, from Bangladesh to if you if you go to Dhaka to Cox's Bazaar, which is the business destination by flight, it will take one hour, but within 30 minutes, you can go to Calcutta, which is the capital of West Bengal. By road, you can go to Assam, by road, you can go to Meghalaya, by road, you can go to Darjeeling, Sikkim, and onward, you can connect to the Bhutan and Nepal. So what actually we should focus on, it's a domestic, but I, I am I'm naming it the extended domestic market, you know. So Calcutta, though is a new country, is, a, is an, another country, but we can concentrate Calcutta as an extended domestic tourism. So in that way, you know, we will be both the country will be benefited. Uh, the Calcutta people, Indian people can come to Bangladesh. Bangladesh people can go to India. But unfortunately, the scenario in COVID in India is extremely bad, and Bangladesh is surrounding in India. So it is very difficult uh, to say that when Bangladesh tourism will be restarting. My assumption is, um, as an as an operator from the last 27 years, that until and unless India. Um, is a hundred percent secured from this COVID situation, then it is very difficult to start restarting the tourism in Bangladesh because the Bangladesh government, the health ministry, is seriously thinking about this Indian variant actually in 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 Bangladesh. So my my idea would be the different tourism boards, for example, the Maldivian tourism boards, or maybe the Sri Lankan tourism board, Nepal tourism board, Bangladesh tourism board. I just last week talked with our CEO of Bangladesh Tourism Board that why don't you organize a webinar seminar to the Nepal Tourism Board and, and invite the Nepalese people to come to Bangladesh and also the Bangladesh people to go to Nepal, you know. Okay, fine. In Nepal, they got the international tourists, but such situation is something like this. As I told you earlier, the long haul tourism will take more at least two years in this region. So we should, if we, have, we are talking about our uh, uh, stay on board, we should more concentrate on the regional tourism, extended domestic tourism, and also the, also the cross-border tourism. Thank and you, sir. If the different agencies, just just last point, if the different travel agencies or tour operator agencies in this region, if you can work together, if we can prepare a joint marketing and promotion and the itinerary and circulate to our international market, we can survive at this moment. So I'm requesting Dr. Sakila, please talk with your uh, in 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 private operators to come forward so that we can sit together and I mean prepare our 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 you know in future thank you thank you mr raman you have your prescription is very liberal you know we real liberals like interaction we you know we don't like borders we like you know the whole thing. the world is one economy and that's how we look at it but i i appreciate your vision Thank you, sir. Now I'm going to move on to our uh, third panelist, uh, our honorable member of parliament, Mr. Frank Mueller Rosenthal. Sir, uh, I would like to ask a question or two to you. Uh, I understand you serve on the Committee of Foreign Affairs in the Bundestag, the parliament in Germany. And I would like to get your perspectives about international cooperation for in general uh, for cooperation for recovery recovery of the tourism at the global level more specifically what kinds of initiatives do you see happening between germany and south asia governments in the near future for example easing of visa restrictions certification of vaccination building consumer trust and so forth your thoughts on how to uh, have a more glo global cooperation towards promotion of international tourism over to you, uh, Mr. Miller Rossentry. Yeah, uh, thanks for this uh, question. Uh, I'm, I'm convinced that uh, the world can only fight um, and end this pandemic uh, together. Uh, in this respect, I think we all agree that all nations should work, um, work side by side together. And I want to emphasize that Europe has already done it. Uh, good job in terms uh, of global vaccine uh, distribution. Since January um, 31st, we have uh, distributed more than 113 million doses of a vaccine for, um, of, um, for 43 countries, 43 countries, um, including Japan, 
uh, last week we had a, a German Japan uh, government dialogue, and uh, they were th very thankful uh, for this doses of, um, of, of of vaccine. Um, and it is also true, however, that we have an obligation to protect our citizens by ensuring an adequate supply uh, supply of uh, vaccine. And since this will become less of a challenge as we move into the second and third quarter of this year, I'm convinced that South Asian nations um, in general will increasingly be able to benefit even more from our uh, vaccine distribution. And I think much more from the distribution from uh, India, uh, because in India, uh, the, this is the, the main producing the country in the world. And so um, uh, I think there is a, is a good chance um, to get more uh, uh, vaccine uh, in, the, in the people uh, all, over, all over the world, especially in South Asia. Um, at the same time, I think it is important that we uh, do not focus only on the global rollout of um, uh, vaccines, but also look for different ways um, to ensure that everyone get access to uh, vaccination. In my opinion, um, there should be a triad uh, here between the export of vaccines on the one hand, uh, the development of expansion of production capacities on the other hand, especially in India, and of course the voluntary granting of license of to manufacturer in South uh, Asia. I think this uh, this, this triad uh, is will be a good a good chance um, to. Um, uh, to uh, good chance uh, to make more possible uh, in, the, in the world. Uh, partic a particular challenge will be the opening of our borders of, uh, to travel from Southeast Asia um, and other foreign countries will make sure our citizens uh, stay safe. I think the best way would uh, be to develop a common and transparent m model that will standardize, standardize, uh, standardize entry requirements and quarantine rules between Europe and uh, Southeast Asia nations. And after all, today's PRC or rapid test results are often pr processed by unknown laboratories. Um, so without a standard format uh, or certification system, test results or proof of vaccinations can easily be faked. Uh, in order to build a consumer trust or a priority should therefore uh, be to only allow very late results on vaccination records for cross-border travel. I think this would be a standardization, a standardization of, um, of tests and we have a label, therefore that will be very good. But how can we achieve this? I think the World Economic Forum has set up the Common Trust Network, providing a platform for individuals to demonstrate their health status. Uh, and I'm sure that once uh, these solutions are widely accepted, uh, travel between Germany and South Asia nations will rebound once again. And I think um, we can not only think in uh, vaccination, we all want to think that we, what are um, different um, possibilities uh, to get access uh, in, in these countries because Germans love to travel. We have a very, very, very big domestic market. Uh, I think two thirds of German peoples in this year um, uh, will stay in holiday in their own country because we have, to, we have uh, the oceans in the north and we have the mountains in the south. And, uh, and so people move around Germany to stay in holiday at home. So domestic uh, holiday is it's amazing. I live in the holiday region in Germany. We have the mountains here. And every flat, every flat owned uh, by a private person is sold out to Hulu summer. So that is, if you, if you, if you, if you want today, book one flat uh, for or one house, to, for a family to stay on um, vacation in our mountain region, you have no chance, no chance uh, to get any flat, no chance to get any house. Uh, we have 100% sold out, and this is only because we have this very, very strong domestic, um, domestic uh, vac vac vacation market, and I 
would wish that we have the same figure of domestic markets also in India or in um, Bangladesh or in other or in other countries that you are not that um, the, uh, that you are more independent uh, from foreign people. But right now, of course, we want to travel. We want to we want to come out from Germany. We want to, we want to travel to India. We want to travel to Bangladesh. We want to travel to Malaysia. We want, we want to travel in the region, and so we have uh, we, we have to find so, so, solutions. Um, and I, but I think um, we. It's not that far away uh, from from the prospects from the perspective from today. I think three or four months uh, if, uh, before um, there was more shadow on the perspective uh, right now, as right now. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Uh, I had I took the uh, opportunity to read your tourism policy of two thousand nineteen. One thing really comes out, and that's, I think, demonstrated in what you just said, a very robust domestic tourism activities. Uh, one specific thing that seems to have special uh, catering towards the elderly people and the children, that they are comfortable in be part of this whole uh, whole uh, journey, this, this fun and, uh, and the leisure. Uh, any food for thought, what, you know, from your personal experience or others, what South Asia could take from your uh, domestic uh, tourism policies uh, uh, and try to implement in our country. I know these are different cultures, different uh, economies, but what, especially in terms of catering to all strata of the population, that is pretty impressive with the German policy. Any thoughts or any words of wisdom on that? Um, what, what is the reason for the strong domestic uh, market? Or what, no, no. What, I mean, I'm talking about your policy also promotes, you know, the all inclusiveness, you know, in terms of making sure there are uh, the environment is good for the elderly, the, you know, people with special conditions, children, that uh, the environment is created or they are comfortable in traveling within Germany. That's kind of embedded in your policy document, what I've read. So my question to you, uh, and that policy sounds very good, but your reflections on that, whether we can translate that into other countries in South Asia about how to cater to special needs people uh, and be part of this whole journey. I mean, it has more value than just, you know, revenue, but an inclusiveness of the whole society into that. If you could reflect, if you want to. Yes. Um... I think um, it, it depends what you mean with, in, with, with inclusive uh, inclusiveness. Of course, um, if you earn money, and I think that this, this, this is the, uh, the biggest uh, difference between uh, Southeast Asia and, and Germany, um, that we have, um, there is no unemployment ever. So the people earn a plenty of amount of money, and so they spend their money in the holiday, of course. So and uh, also in Germany, and we have very beautiful uh, sites. You, you said it already. Very beautiful environment, and like India, also you have also very beautiful places. And when I last two years, I visited three times India. So in three completely different. Uh, Different sides in, in this in this country, so but um, I do not uh, I do not know whether um, uh, there are so many people from Goa go to North and in, in, in the mountains and so and so we have um, in Germany a lot of people um, they, they they like travel in their own country. Of course, this year uh, not about inclusive like in. Um, like in Spain, there are, German, there are a lot of uh, German people. Uh, they have all inclusive uh, offers uh, where you can where you can drink, eating, all inclusive, um, flat flat rate. Um, but in Germany, this is not um, that is not it's very unusual. In, uh, if you stay at home, if you if you uh, if you have your vacation in Germany, all inclusive is very unusual. So of course you have to you have to pay uh, per, per class per meal. Uh, but of course with every family, with every part family, and so I think it's um, something about uh, how how much money you have uh, you have 
to spend uh, you can spend in your in your holiday in your holidays and because in this time uh, COVID-19 uh, a lot of people have uh, no chance to spend money um, and so vacation uh, is a very very big market especially the domestic market thank you sir uh, we are almost done with our panel discussion, but I'm, I'm being the moderator, I'm looking at my clock. I'll give this opportunity to each of you, two minutes, no more, maybe three. Anything that we have not covered, but you think you should want to send a message or any comment, I start with Mr. Rahman. In two minutes, just say anything that I have, we have yes, not covered uh, or you wanted to say. Yes, exactly. Uh, my idea is for our survival, uh, we should uh, work or act as an one destination. Southeast Asia should focus themselves or position the, themselves in one destination like European Union, like ASEAN or some other countries, you know, maybe one destination with different diversified product. So that is actually at this moment our survival. And also I'm requesting FNF, Dr. Nazbul and your full team, you also can help a lot for our starting of tourism and also for our future development. You can also do some of the research, you know, I mean, we have a, we are lack behind to do this type of research, you know, at this moment, what would be our uh, duty, you know, to do some of the awareness program, to do some of the workshops, the local communities, the community-based tourism is very popular now in Bangladesh. Some of the areas, we also have some homestays, you know, there are some local operators, local tourist guide. They are actually passing very crucial time. So if you can do some of the research and development for the both the public and private sector for the future of Bangladesh, how we can move forward to uh, mitigate this COVID situation, that would be you. great. I but Thank my you. request that was very is, helpful. Uh, Dr. Mariam and all, please come forward to position ourselves as one destination. Thank you, Mr. Rahman. That was very well done. Situation. Well said. Thank you. Doctor, my favorite person, Doctor Shakila. I will just uh, say something to what Mr. Rahman has mentioned. You know, ideal situation, yes, uh, the the um, the region should act as one. But can we? Politics come into play, and uh, you ha you need to strangle all the politicians uh, before you could actually uh, come as one region. You Including know, including the third panelist. So including the panelists yes <laughs> okay <laughs> we all need to get strangled before that ideally that is what it should be you know we all should uh uh, uh talk uh walk the talk we should all come with uh uh with uh um similar strategies uh you know but then ego comes into play and then um what Maldives does the other country wouldn't do what Pakistan does, uh, the India wouldn't do. Um, and the, what, what Nepal does, Bangladesh wouldn't do. Ego, not because not because it is uh, not the right thing to do. It, it can be the right thing to do, but because Pakistan did it, uh, India wouldn't do. Because Nepal did it, the other country wouldn't do. You know what, what I mean? I mean, I'm not just finger pointing at any one particular person. Um, if we act as one, and if we just bypass the politics, and if we work on the regional interest, um, uh, bypassing the Western interests, uh, things will improve. But that doesn't happen. That's an in ideal world. It wouldn't happen, you know. So, li like for example, the robust recovery in tourism um, uh, compared to many destinations in the Maldives was because they took firm actions in order to create um, a safe environment. So I think for basically for the, um, uh, the, 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 the last thing that I would say is all the pandemic has instilled in us and the whole world um, is that we need to focus and look at safety and hygiene in a completely different way. And hence, we will need to invest both in the physical as well as the technological infrastructure and also bring about mental shift to assure safety and hygiene to overcome the challenges because uh, like, like, for example, in order to win the confidence of tourists and travelers uh, to any country, we must be seen to be serious about our intentions and commitment to protecting them. So I think that is the key. Now, with or without pandemic, like, for example, Maldivians will travel to um, India because that is where they go to party. That is where they go um, uh, 
to enjoy. That is there where they go for the mountains and what we don't have because we come from a flat land. Uh, same would happen if, like for example, the same packages are actually uh, provided in um, in the Maldives. Like for example, we don't see anything from Bhutan. We don't see anything any tourist uh, packages uh, of Bangladesh in the Maldives, you know? So I think uh, tour operators should come on one platform and then start um, um, start promoting each other and then offer what we don't have. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, Mr. Mueller Rosentritt, you have, I give you two options. One, give your thoughts. The second option is to a rebuttal to uh, Dr. Shakila or uh, agree or disagree with her. Over to you, sir. Uh, Yes, I think she is right. I think she is right that we have to bypass the politics uh, because the, um, especially especially in Southeast Asia, because I know a little bit the structure in this region, and we have this we have this uh, Friedrich Nauer Foundation South Asia. We talk about tourism in South Asia. From a Europe perspective, South Asia is South Asia, but it's. India is not India. India is uh, it's more diverse like Europe. You have so much different science. You have different. It's, it's very very diverse. So and so we have we, we speak about different countries like and, and this uh, we have some sometimes um, we have to remember in in Germany that is uh, this is so different. This is so different uh, ways um, of life. For me, I think um, I would say uh, we have to build a bilateral in uh, in, Sing in Singapore. The city state has a similar arrangements with Australia, Brunei, New Zealand, Taiwan, and Vietnam. And I think we have to build um, travel bubbles uh, for for tourism, uh, maybe between Germany and your and one country. And if you build this travel bubbles, um, tourism is, will, will uh, increase. This Bula bubble to Australia and uh, New Zealand. Brunei, Malaysia, Singapore also discussing this um, sub regional travel bubble. So, travel bubbles uh, between Germany Country. Two or three percent of people in Germany know that you can go for, uh, for holiday in Taiwan, for example. I'm sorry, Mr. Müller Rosenberg, we've missed a few of your sentences, but um, apologies. I think it's the internet. Um, um, uh, so thank you, sir. Apologies for this. Uh, poor connection, but let me now uh, thank each of you very sincerely, Mr. Rahman, Dr. Shakira, Mr. Mula Rosentritt, for your very valuable contributions. I myself has learned quite a bit, enjoyed the session. Thank you. Please don't leave us anyone. We will now move to our second uh, event of the evening, and we'll now have a very special gift for our audience, and especially also for the three panelists, a five minute musical interval from Bangladesh. So to do that, may I request my host, Mr. Rajat, to assist me. The, uh, the first performance is a dance by Arisa Aparajita from Bangladesh. She was one of the 12 winners of Fetik Naman Bangladesh's Bangladesh's quote unquote hashtag female forward international national international national campaign. Under this activity, Ms. Aparajita 
share the story of her personal female everyday hero. Arisha will dance to a, Arisha will dance to a classical song written by the Bengali poet and Nobel laureate <coughs> Rabindranath Tagore. So let let's enjoy the dance from Arisha. Excuse me, I do not see anything from the dancers. Um, uh, Mr. Mueller, wasn't it? Sorry, you're actually joined from your phone. That's probably why you can't see it. Excuse me. Okay. Uh, so may I now move on to the? I hope you like the first presentation. We have a second presentation. The second performance is a song by Ashrin Mridha. Ashrin gave an interview. In FNA Bangladesh's Female Forward International uh, National Campaign. In the interview, she reflected on the importance of women's participation in sports. Ms. Mida will be singing a song written by a Bangladeshi museum, Arnold. Here is Ashrin Mida.
I hope you all enjoyed the, thank you, sir. I can see someone clapping, uh, enjoyed the musical interval. Uh, I would not want you to rank which one you like better, the panel session or the musical interval. I'll leave it a very private affair. So we come to the last session of the event, of the evening, which is a question and answer session. Unfortunately, we don't have much time, so I have to limit it to you know just two or three questions. So the first question I would like to ask on behalf of one of the uh, audience, uh, let me literally read the question, and this is to Dr. Mariam Shakila. When we think of reviving the tourism industry and supporting various actors related to this sector, how can we ensure that those involved in the informal economy, such as small businesses, are not left out? Dr. Shakila. Dr. Nagmal, I couldn't hear you. Let me repeat, in one sentence, in this whole revival strategy, uh, all the government interventions, all the things that your associations, you know, the, the big the big and the, you know, uh, companies and others, entrepreneurs, uh, their issues are addressed. But in the process, will the small guys be left out? The informal economy, the small chai wala, this little store or the small informal, uh, you know, souvenir shop, uh, those actors, how do you ensure that they will also survive this pandemic and be able to continue to be uh, part of the tourism sector? I think uh, the first question that you asked in the first question that you asked as answer to those um, among the uh, strategies that the government has actually taken, I have mentioned uh, the kind of packages that has been given in order to uh, protect them. Um, um, like uh, for the uh, there was a program targeted towards self-employed workers, uh, like that means like this little Chaiwalas or even those people who um, who who do the craft um, in the um, um, in the tourism sector, uh, uh, these people um, who has an annual turnover less than um, ten million uh, rufia in two thousand nineteen, uh, these people were given um, uh, compensations. Those people were handed out uh, some money. Um, so there were a lot of programs uh, targeting that through the economic ministry. Uh, it also included um, a lot of, uh, as I mentioned, the debt moratoriums. Uh, they also um, have uh, handed over 5,000 um, rufia uh, to a lot of these people for them to survive uh, the pandemic and then come through because their businesses will improve as soon as the tourism industry improves because these are the people who were actually um who were actually contributing um, to the complement in the tourism industry like for example uh, with craft and all these things so um the maldives are uh, the, the the Maldives scenario is very different to a lot of other countries, and then so Maldives, nothing will happen unless tourism industry actually improves because everything depends on tourism industry. So the government focused on improving the tourism industry so that the other businesses um, will flourish, um, and it has been proven that as soon as the tourism industry started improving. Um, the the small businesses started improving but then in a lockdown like this today as i speak right now we are in a lockdown and obviously all the businesses are locked down so nobody nobody is operating so even a business like um like like for example ours or anybody else only for that there are certain people who can be out or who can be delivered all the businesses are closed um so once the once the uh, once the virus comes under control, then the businesses will be opened. Tourism sector is not affected that much, except for except from the countries that has issued uh, like travel warnings. The tourists are coming, and from not only from uh, so the resort sector is very much uh, bubbled because there are certain strategies that follow 
for the tourists to be taken over their one island, um, one resort concept is helping. Um, and then so the tourism sector has to survive for the other businesses to survive. I mean, it will be different from Bangladesh and all that, you know, they can work independently, but not in the Maldives. Okay, thank you. The last question, I, I'm afraid I can't uh, at, uh, attend to all the questions, uh, uh, some very good questions. And this is uh, to Mr. Miller Rosentrade. Mr. Rosentrade, what, uh, uh, what we see is a stop and go thing going on, not only in our travel, you know, to, uh, to, uh, I, I can't buy a ticket to go to London to see uh, the Trafalgar Square, uh, or what, uh, the London uh, Bridge, uh, because uh, they might shut down uh, any day. So same goes in uh, domestic uh, travel also. So given this, do you see there is a need for some sort of a international or a at least regional agreement about how to really uh, guide the potential tourists in terms of the planning? Because it's quite frustrating for consumers like you and me, but at the policy level, do you see the need for some sort of a consensus amongst countries, uh, not only within the region, but perhaps even beyond the region about uh, some guidelines about tourism? Over to you, sir. Yes, of course. I think this is, I think this is crucial um, uh, to have this agreement, not only between countries, also also between region, because then you have uh, guidelines uh, what you should do, and especially in Germany, uh, guidelines are very well known. And so, I mean, I think agreements is very, very, is very good because now the people um, also look after a modal region. They look after regions where they can go to, and uh, there is an example of. Um, it is uh, Abu, da uh, Abu Dhabi, uh, United um, Arab Emirates. Um, they're, what, they, they have a special agreement. They have a special travel bubble uh, with Germany. And a lot of my friends, uh, they they want to go to a holiday. They move to uh, uh, to to Dubai, to Abu Dhabi. And as and this is very this is very important. You see, uh, regions they have this, they have agreements. Um, the, the people come. So this is so. I look. The, the answer of your question is yes. It is it, it, it is crucial. Thank you very much. With that, I'm going to conclude our question and answer session. But we're not done yet. I now request my boss, my regional director. Dr. Carson Klein, Regional Director, South Asia Fair Development Foundation, to give some uh, concluding remarks and a vote of thanks. Over to you, Dr. Klein. Distinguished panelists, thank you very much. Uh, honorable member of the German Bundestag, ladies and gentlemen, uh, thank you very much for this highly engaging and open discussion with very uh, numerous suggestions also for the work of Friedrich Naumann Foundation in South Asia. As you know, we engage closely with the concerns, especially of economies and there of small and medium sized enterprises. And since tourism sector, is also strongly influenced by those small and medium sized enterprises. And furthermore, is crucial for many countries, as we heard tonight in our region, and also has the potential to be a key driver for futures economies development. We will definitely continue these discussions and elaborations on this topic. So thank you very much, Mr. Rahman, also uh, for underlining the necessity of our work in this particular field. Let me once again express our special thanks to the panelists, Honorable Dr. Shakila and Mr. Rahman, and of course, uh, to Honorable Member of the German Bundestag, 
Frank Müller Rosentritt. Thanks to you, Dr. Hossein, being yourself a very uh, important and successful entrepreneur uh, in the country. We would like to express our appreciations to with this absolutely unique one of its kind certificates and ah, here they are. Um, you won't find that in any other global context. So please uh, accept that as our small and humble gift for this uh, for this time. We will de definitely send it over to you. Thanks also to uh, the teams of Reich Naumann Foundation, especially the Stuttgart office um, and um, the head of this office, Mrs. Hasting. Thanks to the colleagues in Bangladesh and as well as in India for the excellent organization of this event. Thank you uh, to the representatives of various associations and media and a special thanks to you, ladies and gentlemen, for being such an attentive audience. I would like to take this opportunity to remind you of uh, two uh, next events, which we have tomorrow on 27th at 6.30 German time about um, peace for Afghanistan. How can the peace process foster a roadmap for development? And also on 2nd June at 6 p.m. German time, the topic there will be Bhutan, country of happiness and freedom. My colleagues and I hope to see you face to face soon. And um, on behalf of Friedrich Naumann Foundation, I now wish you a very, very nice evening. And as we put it in Germany, uh, um, a safe and pleasant virtual nach Hause week. Alles Gute, einen schönen Abend und vielen Dank. Bye. Thank you, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you very much again. Bye bye. Bye. How how good is it? Auf Wiedersehen, ja. Yeah. Uh, I really okay. hope that, we'll see, that, that we will see uh, each other. And as I promised, uh, Dr. Schakeliam and, uh, and uh, Mr. Rahman and Dr. Uh, Mr. Müller Rosentritt, uh, we definitely will continue uh, this uh, very, very uh, sophisticated talks. We really uh, identified tourism as a very relevant sector. So um, uh, we will just uh, sit together, Dr. Hossein and, uh, and others in order to uh, find out what would be very good ways to really help fostering uh, tourism in South Asia. So thank you very much again for your very, very good insights and um, yeah, different experiences.